All right. Open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Have you ever had the opportunity to do something and you thought it over and you didn't take advantage of that opportunity and later on you said, hmm, I wish I would have done that. Maybe, oh yeah, you can turn that off, thank you. Maybe, you know, it was buying Microsoft for a dollar per share in 1987 or whenever they started, or maybe it was some other thing like a job opportunity and you kind of waffled back and forth and decided to stay and then that company went berserk and you found out that was a great opportunity that you lost out on. We've all had those kinds of things where we'd like to go back and be, you know what, I wish I would have done that, right? I wish I'd have taken advantage of that. And that's simply just not knowing what the future is in most cases, right? We just trust the Lord with our future and uh, uh, do what the Lord says. And, and maybe investing in, in uh, Microsoft would have had some bad outcomes for you if you would have done it. When it comes to spiritual things, there are people that have had amazing, great, huge opportunities to accept the Lord as their personal Savior and never do. I mean, there are people who probably went to a good Bible-believing church their whole life, from the time they were a little kid till they passed away in their old age, and they never accepted the Lord as their Savior. Opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. They heard the Word of God, and they never accepted. Then there's some other groups and we hear about them once in a while. God supplies in, in amazing ways. There, there are some missionary stories out there that I've read and, and uh, heard about where a missionary would be traveling through the middle of Africa and his you know, truck broke down and out of, the, out of the woods steps some kind of native Indian and just says, God has sent me to find you. You are to come and tell us about God. And you're like, what? How does, it, how does those kinds of things even happen, right? There's this one opportunity, and God made sure that this car broke down so that this missionary could go back into the jungles and preach for the very first time to this uh, group of uh, Indians that are there or whatever, and they come to know the Lord as their Savior. The one opportunity that they have. It happens, doesn't it? Well, when we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verses 13 through 14, we are going to have a, a, a contrast between the Jews who had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to believe God and what he has done for them over the course of thousands of years. And they're going to be contrasted to this church in Thessalonica who had a real short time span where Paul was preaching to believe. Opportunity lost for the Jews. And really you can say that about them today, can't you? Opportunity lost. And they still have the Bible that they can turn to. It's not, it's not like it's not there. They can dig into it and believe, or they can reject, can't they? When we get to verse 13, really verses 13 through 16 is one paragraph, but we're only going to get through verses 13 and 14 this morning. And when we talk about redemption, it really turns into something that's bittersweet, doesn't it? Sweet for the believer. Those that know the Lord as their personal Savior, they get redemption. Eternity in heaven, eternity in the presence of God. When you talk about lost opportunity, then it's bitter, right? It's kind of a bittersweet thing. Those that die and don't know the Lord as their personal Savior, they go to hell. That's their eternal resting place. So it is bittersweet for the believer. Because we all know people who have died in their sins. We all know people who have died and didn't know the Lord as their personal Savior. 
In the Old Testament, when I think of opportunity lost, I think of Cain. Not just the Jews, but I think of Cain in particular. What a waste of a lost opportunity. Born to Adam and Eve. At one time, Adam and Eve were sinless. Didn't even know sin. Imagine being Adam and Eve explaining to your children what it was like to be sinless. What the Garden of Eden was like. These amazing trees and plant life. Not harmed by the curse of sin. Not having to work by the sweat of your brow to go get your food for the day. You know, you just wake up and walk out. Oh, look, there's all my food. Don't have to go pick the weeds. Don't have to go water it. Do nothing. And your sustenance is fulfilled for you for the whole day. Pretty cool, huh? Adam walked with God in the garden. He was instructed about the truth from God himself. Cain, Adam's son, rejected God, his word, his salvation. Someone else that I'm reminded of is Jesus' half-brother, James. For most of his life, James rejected Jesus as Messiah, Jesus as God. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? But he did. It's interesting, we went to the uh, Ark exhibit this last week. And they showed uh, in there, they were showing some of the things about how the earth is the way that it is. And they mentioned in one of the little things there that James was Jesus' half-brother and he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after Jesus died and rose from the dead. And there was some people standing there looking at it going, hmm, I've never heard that before. We're going to have to go look that up. <laughs> They're not being taught a lot of the Bible if they've never heard that before. <laughs> But it's true. It's one of the evidences that Jesus was God. His own brother who rejected him for most of the time finally accepted once Jesus rose from the dead. Cain rejected. He rejected his word. He rejected his salvation. Hebrews 11.4 tells us that he spurned righteousness. 1 John 3.12 told us that he chose to follow Satan. And Jude 11 tells us that he was destroyed eternally. That is a lost opportunity. In the New Testament, I think of Judas. Talk about a lost opportunity. Judas had the privilege of sitting at the feet of Jesus. Jesus taught him daily. He experienced what only 12 men experienced, intimacy with Jesus Christ. He rejected God. He rejected Christ. He rejected the word of God. He sold Jesus for money. He committed suicide. And he went to hell eternally. That was his story. What a lost opportunity. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Can you imagine that? Sitting at the feet of Jesus and rejecting him. By the way, the greater the opportunity, the greater the tragedy of rejection is. And the Bible tells us that there's a greater eternal punishment. I'm not certain I know exactly what that means. It can just mean that for eternity you got to think in your head, I sat at the feet of Jesus, I listened to his teaching, and I never accepted him as my personal savior, and now I'm in hell thinking about this for eternity. Not just today, not just tomorrow, not yesterday, all those days before, not for a thousand years into the future. Eternity. That's a scary thought to me. Now what about the Jews? Because this is who they're going to contrast. The Jews are swept from Old Testament to the New Testament, and they illustrate a great tragedy. They had the oracles of God. 
Romans 3 says not only the oracles, but also adoption and glory and covenants and the giving of the law. Romans 9 says that the Jews nevertheless rejected God, his word, and God's Messiah, and collectively represent the greatest tragedy of lost opportunity. Thousands of years of history. And over the course of that time, many or most are in hell. Because most of the time, the Jews were rejecting God, weren't they? <laughs> now what about the church in Thessalonica? They had a very limited opportunity to hear the gospel. It happened just over the course of a few weeks. Three Sabbaths in Acts in chapter 17, Paul preached. He may have preached for a few more weeks, so maybe five weeks they had at the most. Limited opportunity to believe. We see a people to be happy for and a people to be sad for. A people who are blessed and a people who are cursed. Paul gives three reasons to be glad for the Thessalonians and three reasons to be sad for the Jews. We're going to see the three reasons to be happy for the Thessalonians in today's message. Next week, we'll see the three reasons to be sad for the Jews. Now remember, we've talked about Thessalonica. It's a pagan city. It's a seaport. It's a trade route. Remember, it's a great place where ships would uh, dock, unload their goods, and then there was a road that went right through there, east-west. And so people were in and out. It was a haven of horrible lifestyles and evil, false religion, fakes, quacks, if you will. And Paul had been there and taught, and he thought when he left, the church would probably just fall apart. That would be your natural assumption. He sent Timothy back to see how they were doing. You know what he finds? Not only have they not defected, but they're going strong. So Paul congratulates them. And so in verse 13 then, we pick it up. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. We thank God for you. We do it all the time. We don't stop. And he uses the word because. That brings us into the reasons. We thank God for you because. What? When you receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. First thing. He was thankful for their reception of the word of God. Because when ye received the word of God, ye heard of us, ye received it. They had the right response to the word of God. You know what many people today and all throughout the world, they hear the word of God and they don't accept it. They don't accept it for what it is. They don't accept it for how it was written. They'll say all kinds of things about it. They'll say, well, it's an allegory. In other words, yeah, it's not really truth. Things in there are wrong. I mean, come on. Can, can a flood really happen? How can a flood happen? And, and get this. <laughs> On this ark, they put two of every kind of every animal. Sure. How are you going to do that? You know how many animals we have on this earth? And how many were on the earth then? How can you put them all on the ark? That's crazy thinking. Come on. And when Ken Ham and Bill Nye, the science guy, had their debate, that was one of the things that Bill Nye talked about, that that's just a ridiculous thought that you could stick all of those animals on that ark. Well, being at the ark experience, they really show amazingly, very plausible ways that they could have done it. Pretty easily, actually. Because you know what? When it comes to dogs, you didn't need a Greyhound and a Dodson and a, oh, what was Toby? Uh, a Cockapoo or whatever. You don't need all those 
different animals on there, do you? And when you do DNA research on them, they know that they all basically come from one animal, a wolf. That's all you needed. <laughs> and guess what? You didn't actually have to have a Trianosaurus Rex, a full-grown Trianosaurus Rex on the ark either. Grr, feed me. You could have it in an egg form, in a baby form. God could make them hibernate like bears do, and other animals, right? There's all kinds of explanations. It does make perfect sense. But guess what? The world thinks that science has proved something about evolution and how we can't put all these species on an ark and all these types of things. So Christians, so-called Christians, buy into it. You know what they'll say instead? Well, there was some kind of localized flood that happened. There was a guy named Noah that had animals. And you know what? His ship floated and survived that local flood and no one else's did. And that's the story of Noah and the ark. And you know what? There's no such thing as the Israelites crossing the Red Sea where God held back the waters. They, they really got it wrong. It's supposed to be the Reed Sea, which is only this deep. And, and the Israelites all went through. And there must have been some kind of explosion, volcano, earthquake, or something that happened that caused this great tidal wave that came through and wiped out the Egyptian army. I mean, they got an answer for everything. Except for what the Bible says. And people in America have great opportunity to hear the Word of God. They have the Word of God in their house, most people do. And they can read it, but they don't. Or they change it to fit their needs. And so you know what they were thankful for? They were thankful that they received the Word of God which you heard of us. You received it. Not as the word of men. That word received, by the way, means, and he's talking about when they went there, and that was Paul, Timothy, and Silas. Received in the Greek means to an, it refers to an outward, external listening. In other words, they listened to the word of God that those three men preached. And the word of God was the message. These guys were the mouthpiece of God at that time. And then, not only did they receive it, but then the verb for ye received it is a subjective reception, and it means they thought about it and they accepted it into their heart. In other words, they became believers. A definite act of saving faith. You know what they didn't do? They didn't look at these guys and say, well, you're just some men, and just because you say it doesn't make it true. You know, I can add all kinds of things to Scripture, can I? I could. I could tell you all kinds of things, and some of you might believe it, because I say it from here. I have a great responsibility to teach you the truth and nothing but the truth, right? To keep my own thoughts and politics and whatever else out of it. Give you the truth of the Word of God. And when I do that, hopefully, you receive it as the Word of God. You can read the words there and see if I'm changing them or not, can't you? You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, if you know the Lord as your personal Savior. He is the one that wrote these words, and He's the one that helps you translate it. So when I say something wrong, the Holy Spirit should work in your heart and say, No, oh, that's not right. And you should challenge me with it. Some of you have challenged me with those things before in the past, too. And it's good. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> Pastor, I don't think I agree with what you said today. And there's been times when I've come back to this pulpit and said, you know what, last week I said this. Upon further study, I think I was wrong. And that's good, isn't it? That's what the Bereans did in the Bible. They went home and they studied what they heard. These people received the words of God not as men, not as some philosopher, not as some psychologist, not as some teacher, 
but as it is. And that word means the genuine word of God. And look what else he says there. Which, which he heard of us, which he received it, that's here, but, um, my eyes are getting all goofed up. I'm going to I'm gonna have to get glasses. I'm sorry to say that. I know it. It says, we, when, we, when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. The verb there almost always refers to God's supernatural action. Worketh. It's effective. And it only is for the believer. The word of God only works in the believer's life. And that's God supernaturally doing it. So what happens? Why is he excited? Well, because they heard the word of God. They knew it wasn't the word of men. They kept it as truth. They kept it as the word of God. And then it effectually worked in them. You know how I know a believer when I see someone? Because I can see the word of God effectually working in them. Being effective. They read the words, they eat it, it becomes part of their life. So how does it work in your life? I'm running out of time. But I'll just give you some of the highlights. How does the word of God work in your life? It saves us, it blesses us, it teaches us and reproves us. First Timothy chapter or Second Timothy chapter three, it corrects us, it trains us in righteousness, it guides us, it counsels us, it revives us. And by the way, it counsels us. That means we really shouldn't have to turn the way of the world and make millionaires out of these psychologists. It revives us, it makes us grow, it warns us. Uh, it judges us, it sanctifies us, it purges us, it frees us, it gives us joy, it protects us, it makes us wise, it prospers us. All over the Bible, we can see how the Word of God works in our lives. So secondly, first, it was the reception of the Word of God. Now he's excited because their gladness in honoring the saints. What does he say there? For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Ye became followers. You know what gives honor to someone? What gives honor to a teacher? What gave honor to Paul and those guys that were there? Was that the church in Thessalonica, <laughs> that church became imitators of Paul and Silas in them. That gives them honor. Have you ever seen a child grow up and hate their parents? You know it's one of the things they'll say? I will never be like my mom or dad. I will not be like them. Why? Because he hates them. He doesn't want to give them any honor, right? You know what gives honor to a parent? When their children imitate them. You know what gives honor to God? When you imitate Christ when you imitate God and when you imitate those who are imitating Christ and God that gives honor by the way it uses the word followers there right you became followers that literally means imitator for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus that's how you do it. You imitate someone, you give them honor. They honor the saints by patterning their lives after them. You want to honor Christ? Imitate him. They also use the word churches there. You see that? It's in the plural. It's the churches of God in Christ. This is speaking about the local assemblies. This is speaking about the individual churches and the individual, individual churches are in Christ also. That's how you know that it's a Bible-believing church. They're in Christ. 
Thirdly, then, perseverance in suffering. So he says, what? You received the word of God, you're honoring the saints, and now you're persevering through your suffering. You see, you're imitating God, which is in Judea, or in Christ. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. You're persevering. One of the things you can tell about a believer, one of the ways that you know that someone has truly accepted the Lord as their personal Savior, is that they persevere. Many people say, oh, I'm a Christian, but then the first hard thing comes along, and they just say, ah, I tried Christianity, and it didn't work. You know, I was supposed to get all this money, and I was supposed to have all this great health, and this was supposed to happen, and that was supposed to happen, and God answers no prayers of mine, so I tried it, now I'm on to something else. That's not what real believers do, right? It doesn't mean that that person never accepted the Lord as their Savior. God can be working in their life in a different way. But it's not evident of a believer. A believer perse perseveres through persecution. And that's what this church was doing. The church in Judea had been through a lot of persecution. A lot of hostility. By the way, it was coming at the hands of the Jews in many cases. And there must have been great animosity towards this church. They were in a place that was filled with sin and sinful people. And this group was, perse was persevering through it. Can you contrast this group with the Jews then? Well, absolutely. Look at verse number 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men. We'll preach on this next week. But look at what it says that the Jews did. The Jews killed the Lord Jesus. What did the Thessalonians do? accepted him. This church did. The Jews killed their own prophets. <laughs> the group in Thessalonica, they imitated him. The Jews persecuted the believers. The church in, Thessalon in Thessalonica imitated them. Paul and Silas and them, didn't they? And the Jews did not please God the church in Thessalonica honored God and the saints and are contrary to all men. <laughs> the Jews in Thessalonica reached out to other believers. They were a strong church. They didn't hinder the saints. And in verse 16, look at what it says. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins away for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. They are even told not even go talk to them. They didn't want the word of God going to them. They didn't want them to be believers. What a contrast, right? Where are we today? Well, I trust that we're like the church in Thessalonica. Now we have great opportunity. But where there's great opportunity, we have a great responsibility, don't we? Not only to believe the words of God, but to live them out through our lives. There's nothing holding us back. We live in a pretty free world. I know we might feel like they're starting to get impinged upon us. But we still can go out and live like a believer here, can't we? And we can still come together and worship together and have church, sing praises to God. We need to take advantage of that opportunity. It has eternal consequences, by the way, doesn't it? Let's have a word of prayer. And we have a closing song. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for this lesson that you gave to us. Lost opportunity. 
for much of America, really. The Word of God is not going forth out of pulpits, but it's available. People have the Word of God in their hands and can get a Bible. They can read it. I pray that more would accept and then fill themselves with your Spirit. And I know we desire to have uh, some peace in America. It's only going to happen if people give themselves to you. It's only going to happen if they live out the words that are written in Scripture. Father, I pray that we would do our part, be ready to tell others of the hope that is in us. And Father, I pray that we would see others come to know you as our Savior. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Number 552 in your hymnal.